Hello everyone. Today I'll be discussing the physical findings of cirrhosis. The learning objectives are to identify the common physical findings, to explain the basic pathophysiological mechanisms which cause these findings, and last, to consider test characteristics such as positive and negative likelihood ratios when estimating the probability of cirrhosis in a patient with one or more aforementioned findings. The physical findings of cirrhosis can be categorized based upon which of the three major pathophysiological derangements are primarily responsible for them. These derangements are first, portal hypertension, in which increased resistance to flow through the portal venous system leads to high pressure within the portal vein. Second, abnormal hemodynamics, which manifests as several abnormalities of the vital signs. And third, a decreased number of functioning hepatocytes. Hepatocytes have a large number of different functions, so this category can be further divided into decreased protein synthesis, decreased conjugation of bilirubin, decreased detoxification of blood, and an abnormal balance of the sex hormones. Let's take a look at one category at a time. First is portal hypertension. The most overt problem this causes is ascites, which is collection of fluid in the peritoneal space leading to progressive abdominal distension. I'm going to take a small digression to discuss ascites in more detail. Ascites is particularly important because it can be very uncomfortable, can restrict movement of the diaphragm and thus impair breathing, and the acidic fluid can become infected in a condition called spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. There are many etiologies of ascites, with cirrhosis being the most common in the U.S. To understand why cirrhosis causes ascites, we need to look at something called the Starling Equation. The Starling Equation predicts how quickly and in which direction fluid moves between two compartments based upon the hydrostatic and oncotic pressures of each, as well as the permeability of the membrane separating them. In cirrhosis, the relevant values are the capillary hydrostatic pressure, which in this case is approximately the portal vein pressure, and the capillary oncotic pressure, which is primarily determined by serum albumin concentration. In cirrhosis, the combination of high portal vein pressure and the low serum albumin results in a net movement of fluid from the portal venous system into the interstitial space around those capillaries, which eventually leads back into the peritoneal space. Ascites actually has its own set of physical findings independent of the presence or absence of cirrhosis. First is an abnormal contour to the abdomen, often referred to as bulging flanks, as seen here. From contour alone, it may be impossible to distinguish ascites from massive bowel distension, but it's usually distinguishable from obesity. In obesity, the adipose tissue is deposited circumferentially around the body. The anterior and posterior sides receive roughly the same amount of excess tissue. In ascites, however, the peritoneal cavity only extends posteriorly so far. Thus, the apparent distension only extends so far as well. This is difficult to appreciate in the supine patient, but is much easier to see from the side when the patient is standing. Another finding is called shifting dullness. To understand how this works, let's imagine an exam table on which we have a patient with ascites, in this case looking a bit jaundiced. Now imagine percussing along his abdomen from the midline outward. It starts off sounding very resonant. And then suddenly, there's a transition point where it begins to sound dull. Why is that? Imagine what the inside of the patient's abdomen looks like. All of the acidic fluid, which can move around relatively freely under the effect of gravity, settles to the bottom. What looks like empty space on top is where the air-filled bowels literally float. Thus, percussion above the transition point sounds resonant and below sounds dull. To know whether or not the existence of such a discrete transition is from ascites, we need to ask the patient to roll onto his or her side. And we repeat the same process again. Now the transition point relative to external landmarks seems to have moved. That's because the acidic fluid inside remains in the most dependent position. Another finding in ascites is called a fluid wave. The technique used to identify this requires two examiners. One examiner places a hand on one side of the abdomen 
and the other examiner lays his or her hand vertically against the midline. The first examiner then makes a sudden inward motion with one hand and attempts to feel a delayed push against the opposite hand as a consequence of a wave passing through the intraperitoneal fluid. The hand on top is meant to prevent movement of the abdominal wall itself from causing a false positive. Although it's frequently done, I personally find the fluid wave challenging to interpret and believe its inter-observer agreement to be low. Moving back to the other findings attributable to portal hypertension, there is lower extremity edema, which forms for much of the same reason as ascites, including a contribution from hypoalbuminemia. These two findings usually coexist in cirrhosis. Finding ascites in the absence of lower extremity edema should be a trigger to search for another etiology of the ascites, such as an intra-abdominal malignancy. There is also splenomegaly, though its development may be multifactorial, as splenic size does not correlate well with portal pressures. I won't review here the techniques used to identify a large spleen, other than to point out that palpation for splenomegaly is much more reliable than percussion. Next, there can be prominent venous collaterals formed, as blood seeks an alternative route back to the heart that bypasses the portal system. These alternative paths are called porticable or portosystemic anastomoses. In one possible anastomosis, paraumbilical veins, which usually drain into the portal system and are tiny, instead dilate and demonstrate reversal of flow. Blood then moves from the portal system backwards to the enlarged paraumbilical veins to the abdominal wall, where visible collaterals are created with the epigastric veins. In its most classic form, this finding is called caput medusae, or head of the medusa, the monster from Greek mythology. The name is derived from the fact that the radially oriented, tortuous veins mimic the appearance of the medusa's snake-covered head. Occasionally, the flow of blood through these collaterals becomes so prominent that a continuous venous hum is audible with auscultation. This sound is referred to as the Kruval Heer Baumgarten murmur, though I personally don't like that term because classically the word murmur is reserved for sounds emanating from the heart. The Kruval Heer Baumgarten hum seems more appropriate to me. So those were all findings caused by portal hypertension. Let's look at another set of findings, the one of abnormal hemodynamics. There are three. Mild to moderate hypotension, whereby a typical systolic blood pressure of a cirrhotic patient is 90 to 120 millimeters of mercury. Mild to moderate tachycardia, with a typical resting heart rate of 90 to 110 beats per minute. And less commonly discussed, but equally as important, a blunted cardiac response to physiologic stress. So even if cardiac output at baseline for the cirrhotic patient is increased, heart rate and contractility are unable to increase further in the setting of sepsis or hypovolemia. This has rarely been referred to as cirrhotic cardiomyopathy. The etiology of these abnormal hemodynamics is not entirely clear, though there is strong speculation that it comes from some as-of-yet unidentified circulating vasoactive substance. Let's move on to discuss the findings due to decreased number of functioning hepatocytes, starting with decreased protein synthesis. In this discussion of physical findings, the protein of greatest relevance is albumin. As mentioned earlier, hypoalbuminemia contributes to the formation of ascites and the lower extremity edema. In addition, it's believed to be part of the mechanism behind two findings of the fingernails. The first of these are called Terry's nails, in which the majority of the nail bed appears white with no lunula, leaving only a small strip of pink between most of the nail bed and the white nail tip. The finding is not specific for cirrhosis. However, when seen in a patient with a known history of alcohol dependence, the probability that the patient has underlying cirrhosis increases dramatically. Another nail finding is Murky's nails. These are composed of alternating white lines running parallel to the lunula. The lines are actually not part of the nail, but rather lie within the nail bed. Thus, they disappear with pressure placed on the nail, and they do not move with nail growth. As with Terry's nails, they are not specific for cirrhosis, and how hypoalbuminemia and malnutrition in general contributes to these findings is not known. The next problem is decreased conjugation of bilirubin. Normally, when red blood cells break down, the heme molecule is released from hemoglobin 
and then convert it into a compound called biliverdin within the macrophages. This is then converted into unconjugated bilirubin. Because unconjugated bilirubin is relatively insoluble, for efficient excretion into the bile, it must be joined with glucuronic acid in the liver to form conjugated bilirubin. Unconjugated and conjugated bilirubin are more commonly referred to as indirect and direct bilirubin respectively, which is a reference to the lab techniques used to measure them. When there are too few hepatocytes functioning, bilirubin cannot be conjugated, which means it can't be effectively excreted into the bile and thus its concentration increases. This leads to the findings of jaundice, a yellowish discoloration of the skin, and scleral icterus, a yellowish discoloration of the eyes. Both of these can usually be detected when the total bilirubin exceeds 2.5 to 3 mg per deciliter. There's an old discussion about which location in the body is best to detect jaundice. For example, when I was in med school, I remember a seasoned professor insisting that under the tongue was the best location. In my experience, when it comes to identifying early jaundice, far more important than location is the quality of light. Bright white daylight is probably best, certainly much better than the fluorescent lighting found in many hospital rooms. The next pathophysiologic derangement in cirrhosis is the decreased detoxification of blood. Now that's a very vague description of a very complex collection of biochemical processes, but there's a reason for that. We don't really understand the biochemistry involved. What we do know is that failure of detoxification leads to somnolence, slow and slurred speech, and a finding called asterixis, all of which together comprise a clinical syndrome of hepatic encephalopathy. To demonstrate asterixis, the patient is asked to hold his or her arms outstretched with wrists extended and fingers straight. There is an occasional irregular motion in which one hand at a time will experience sudden flexion of either the wrist and or the metacarpal joints which will then immediately return to the previous position. For the most part, asterixis is discussed only in the context of liver failure, but it can also be seen in advanced renal failure and hypercapnia, among other forms of metabolic encephalopathy. In the simplest story of what causes hepatic encephalopathy, it's attributed to the simple compound ammonia. The higher the ammonia, the worse the encephalopathy. Unfortunately, this is not strictly true. Here's the results of one of multiple studies that looked at the levels of venous ammonia as a function of the clinical severity of encephalopathy among patients with cirrhosis. Each small dot represents a single patient. You can see that patients with grade 0, or no clinical evidence of encephalopathy, did not have different ammonia levels from those with mild to moderate encephalopathy, and all three of those groups essentially overlap with the normal range. It's not until the encephalopathy is severe in stages 3 or 4 that the ammonia level can differentiate the altered mental status from hepatic encephalopathy from other etiologies. There are a number of theories about this observation. The most obvious is that ammonia itself is not a direct contributor to encephalopathy, but is rather an indirect and imperfect surrogate for an as-of-yet unidentified mediator of the condition. Another proposed explanation is that ammonia levels may vary significantly over the course of the day, but the development or resolution of clinically evident encephalopathy is delayed by a number of hours due to permeability of the blood-brain barrier and other similar factors. One finding related to detoxification that is more definitively linked to a specific toxin is called feeder hepaticus. This is a specific odor to the breath of patients with advanced liver failure, which is sometimes described as either a sweet, musty odor or slightly feculent one. Multiple studies have demonstrated that this compound, dimethyl sulfide, is the predominant cause. The final relevant pathophysiological derangement is an abnormal balance of the sex hormones. Specifically in liver failure, there appears to be an increased systemic release of an androgen called androstenedione. This leads to increased peripheral conversion to estrone and from there to other estrogens. In addition, there appears to be an increase in sex hormone binding globulin, which binds to testosterone, decreasing the amount of the free biologically active form of this hormone. The net consequence is an imbalance between estrogens and testosterone. There are five major physical findings related to this imbalance. Testicular atrophy, gynecomastia, 
loss of axillary and chest hair, palmar erythema, which is manifested by redness of the thenar and hypothenar eminences, which blanch with pressure and which spares the center of the palm, and the last, spider angiomas, also called spider nevi, which are small skin findings typically seen on the chest, shoulders, and upper back. These also blanch with pressure, and they refill from the center outward. A few spider angiomas are occasionally seen in normal healthy individuals, but an arbitrary cutoff of more than five is generally considered suggestive of underlying pathology. You might have noticed that nowhere in this video have I yet discussed examination of the liver itself. While detection of a firm nodular liver edge on palpation may suggest cirrhosis, estimation of hepatic size on exam has limited role in its diagnosis. Part of the reason for this is that measurement of the liver in a single dimension provides a relatively inaccurate estimation of size and thus probability of liver disease due to the great variability of the liver's shape in three dimensions between different people. Most importantly, however, cirrhosis can result in either an enlarged or, once advanced, a small shrunken liver. I'll end with the evidence behind these physical findings. That is, what are the sensitivities and specificities of the findings for cirrhosis, or more importantly, the positive and negative likelihood ratios? An article in JAMA's excellent ongoing series on the rational clinical exam looked at this issue in 2012. Here's a summary of their review of the literature. The physical findings are listed from highest to lowest positive likelihood ratio. The best available evidence demonstrates that of all the findings of cirrhosis, the ones whose presence most significantly increases the odds of a patient having cirrhosis is teres nails and gynecomastia. This is interesting because in my experience, these are among the least frequently discussed findings of cirrhosis. The more commonly discussed findings of distended veins, encephalopathy, and ascites are up there as well. And notice where hepatomegaly is, the very bottom. So the presence of hepatomegaly only modestly increases the odds a patient has cirrhosis. The last important observation to make here is that the positive likelihood ratios are, as a whole, much, much more significant than the negative likelihood ratios. That means that the physical exam is much better at ruling in a diagnosis of cirrhosis than ruling it out. That concludes this video on the physical findings of cirrhosis. I hope you found it interesting and useful.